What's up everybody? Filming on my phone today. Hope that's all right. Hopefully everything comes out good. I did take down my last upload of those two book reviews because they were just all over the place. I got a bunch of the characters mixed up. Um, and one of the Christopher Marlowe plays called Edward II, um, that was a challenging book review to do our play review. Um, and I'm currently doing a reread of Edward II. Um, I'm definitely understanding it a lot better now. And I think when the second rereading is done, we can update you guys on a, uh, a review of Edward II. Um, I did buy some new books, so we're going to talk about, we're going to do a little short book haul. But I did want to discuss Maul Flanders. I also finished this along with The Broken Wings by Khalil Gibran last month. Uh, so I wanted to update you guys on Maul Flanders. I've got some annotations here, not a lot. I did not physically annotate this book, uh, just to kind of keep it in good condition. Um, but Maul Flanders by Daniel Defoe, I did finish it. Um, and sort of at the halfway point, I was kind of really sick of reading this, uh, but I'm really glad that I stuck with it to the end. It starts to get, to get interesting and good again towards the end of the novel. Um, and there's actually some really compelling questions that are included in the back here that I think we will sort of use as a reference to sort of start the book review. Um, I'm just going to give my sort of quick thoughts. Um, the plot is a little complicated. Uh, but basically, Maul Flanders is born in uh, Newgate Prison. Her mother is a criminal, um, so she is sort of a product of the criminal seedy underworld of England, I believe, uh, in Newgate. And it's sort of uh, this whole novel, or essay rather, it's more like an essay sort of with tinges of a novel, is sort of a treatise on the conditions of... Uh, someone who commits crimes, but it's also a, sort of a statement on the condition of women during the 1600s and sort of their struggles to maneuver themselves in between marriages. Uh, you know, what are the benefits of marriage? Uh, what do women get out of marriage? Um, what is the role of money and property and ownership in the context of women during this uh, time period in Europe? Uh, so that's sort of... Um, loosely what the overall theme is but it's basically about a woman uh, who becomes a career criminal now she's not like a murderer or uh, you know anything crazy like that but she is a thief um, an extortionist uh, sort of a how would you say uh, just a woman who takes advantage of men sometimes but also gets taken advantage of uh, of by men um, so there's sort of this dual personality uh, that exists with Maul Flanders. And I think what makes the novel challenging to read is that basically the whole novel is her going around committing crimes, petty crimes, stealing, um, sort of, you know, taking money, taking silk. She steals silk and, you know, expensive uh, materials to make clothing a lot, which I thought was interesting. Um, there's, you know, some various things where she teams up with other criminals and I forgot exactly what she steals here and there, mostly just money, um, or different forms of property, you know, gold ducats, silver necklaces. Um, but the, the, the reason for me that the novel was so challenging is number one, the way that it's written. And number two is that, uh, Maul Flanders is kind of a hard character to really like and kind of really get behind. But as you read it, um, you do sort of start to feel sorry for her despite her efforts to continue committing crimes. Um, it sort of begs the question of a woman getting stuck in a society where it's hard for them to kind of succeed or it's hard for them to make money unless they're wealthy or unless they have a, a rich husband. Um, but she's a pretty strange character. She marries... Um, she has a sexual relationship with her own brother, um, and also another one of her brothers, I believe, if I've got the story correct here. Um, but very complicated sort of relationship history with Maul Flanders. Um, but, and she also goes on to have kids. Uh, some of them get taken away from her. Uh, and by the end of the novel, she reconnects with her son. Um, and that was kind of beautiful. Um, but going back to what I was saying a second ago about the way that the, the novel is written by Daniel Defoe, it's sort of written as an essay. Um, so the book does a lot of telling, um, but does not um, rely so much on action and dialogue. The dialogue and the action are sort of very sparse. And the 
the way that the novel is told is mostly like an essay. I'm trying to see if I can find uh, sort of a passage here that sort of indicates what I'm talking about. Um, so, it's, for example, here it says, It is true that from the first hour I began to converse with him, I resolved to let him lie with me, if he offered it, but it was because I wanted his help and knew of no, no other way of securing him. But when we were that night together, and as I have said, had gone much at length, I found my weakness, the inclination was not to be resisted, but I was obliged to yield up all even before he asked it. However, he was so just to me that he never operated me with that, nor did he ever express the least dislike of my conduct on any other occasion, but always protested he was much delighted with my company. It is true that he had no, so it's Daniel Defoe is basically telling you, um, I guess from a first person introspection sort of style, he's basically telling you everything, um, but the novel does not rely so much on the actual character experiencing these things. Um, so it's sort of written almost like a diary um, that's written outside of the perspective of Maul Flanders, but it's sort of from her perspective, but it's also sort of an omnipresent narrator, um, but it's told through her, but it comes more across as an omnipresent narrator for some reason. Um, and yeah, it might require definitely a rereading, uh, but I would say this book was really good. It was really compelling. Um, it's just kind of limited in the character development. And I was not very convinced uh, that we were hearing the voice of a woman uh, because it was written by Daniel Defoe in sort of the form of an essay. Um, and it, there were some feminine aspects of the character development in the, in the, in the dialogue or, or the introspection, the narration, but there was something sort of not convincing about Daniel Defoe's delivery that we were supposed to be being communicated to by a woman. Um, so let's just touch upon these questions real briefly. Um, so Virginia Woolf had this to say about Maul Flanders, the advocates of women's rights would hardly care, perhaps, to claim Maul Flanders among their patron saints. And yet it is clear that Defoe not only intended them to speak uh, some very modern doctrines upon the subject, but placed them in circumstances where their particular hardships are displayed in such a way as to elicit our sympathy. Courage, said Maul Flanders, was what women needed and the power to stand their ground, and at once gave practical demonstration of the benefits that would result. So I wouldn't say that Daniel Defoe was a feminist writer, but at the time he was sort of alluding to that, and he also wrote some essays on the condition of women, and he was an advocate that women should be educated, women should be able to own property and sort of elevate themselves in society so that they would not be part of uh, this, so that they would not struggle as much. Um, so Virginia Woolf was a fan of, of uh, Maul Flanders, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, this one question here kind of alludes to what I was talking about. Does Defoe convince the reader that in Maul Flanders we are hearing the voice of a woman? Uh, are there reflections, turn of phrase, emphasis, judgments, and attitudes that are convincingly those of a woman? Explain the author's success or fa failure in capturing the voice of a woman. And like I said, I was not convinced that we were really communicating with a woman, um, although there was something feminine about the delivery. I don't really know exactly what it was. Um, uh, question number two, do we ever see around Maul as we would see around a narrator in a, no in a novel by Vladimir Nabokov? That is, do we know more about her from her words than she knows herself? Does the reader see aspects of her unconscious that she is psychologically incapable of understanding herself? Um, and that was a little bit of a, a, of a challenge for me as the reader, is that there was too much narration and not enough maybe character action and character dialogue. Uh, we sort of got the sense that this was her diary or her mental internal diary. Uh, question number three, is Maul one of those cases which you would say to understand is to forgive? <clears throat> is she to be condemned or exonerated and to what degree in either case? Uh, question number four, <clears throat> would Defoe, do you think, be sympathetic to modern feminism? How do the pro-female sentiments in Maul Flanders and in, on the education of women hold up in the context of contemporary issues of women. So I guess you could definitely argue that Daniel Defoe was a feminist, uh, at least, you know, in lieu of the ability of that sort of mindset in 16, 1700s. 
Um, I wouldn't say he was a radical feminist, but he was definitely a male voice that was supporting sort of the female, uh, you know, sector of society. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and also you had other writers that sort of, you know, push those sort of agendas. Um, but if it is a, a sort of a manifesto on feminism, I wonder why he chose to depict the life and thoughts of a criminal uh, to sort of get that message across as opposed to a woman that was following the rules. I guess maybe it's a little more daring, It's a, right? It's a little more controversial, yeah? <laughs> to depict the life of a criminal woman as opposed to the life of a, you know, an average citizen woman. So before I, you know, extend this ramble on Mall Flanders, I definitely recommend Mall Flanders, but it is a challenge to get through. It does get kind of repetitive. It does get kind of boring. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting sort of rabbit holes and red herrings that Daniel Defoe offers you to go down. Uh, so if you have any Mall Flanders out there, I know my friend uh, from from Spain uh, is a fan of Mall Flanders, or at least read it. Uh, my friend Clarice. So maybe she can give us some more insight onto what I struggled with. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about the books that I'm currently reading. Like I said, we're reading Edward II, and we're also more than halfway through War and Peace now. So we should give myself a pat on the back. Uh, really enjoying this epic novel, War and Peace. Uh, really starting to not master the characters, I would say, but definitely starting to... Remember the characters. There's so many characters in this. Uh, right now, we're hearing about the in, inner dialogue and perspective from Napoleon, uh, who is fighting the Russians in Russia. And there's a lot of really interesting battle scenes. You learn a lot about war. Uh, one question that I have for Tolstoy is that he sort of depicts, he, he is known to be anti-war, I would assume, but his writings about the battle and about war are so tinged with this heroism and this epic sort of dialogue not not dialogue between two people but his 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 dialogue in terms of what his mission is with writing about war and conflict is sort of epic and grandiose and sort of glamorized so i'm not really getting a whole lot of anti-war sentiments from tolstoy i mean it is in there he does talk about the evils of war uh, the chaos of war but there's the way that he writes about the people in the battle and the different characters that are in the army. Um, it's very sort of pro-war in a sense. At least that's the way I'm getting towards it now. I know that's not the consensus of a lot of other readers, but he writes about war in a very exciting manner that does not translate to an anti-war agenda, in my opinion, at least not yet. Like I said, there is some elements in there um, of, of anti-war and of cruelty and he talks about how chaotic the battles are and that battles are not really uh, won by what we understand as one opponent beating the other they're more war, uh, uh, sort of won by just the chaos that unfolds in a battle so I thought that was interesting you've got a lot of really complex uh, controversial relationships in this uh, so definitely a master novel still kind of working our way through that but I've been reading it a little over a month and we're already over halfway through. Uh, another book we did finish was Stephen King on writing and then I lent it to my dad and he actually read it too. So I'm going to get my family a little more into writing, which is great. Uh, this one, this book was rather good. It's got some boring parts and Stephen King definitely to me personally comes across as slightly um, pretentious and kind of preachy and he's trying to crack too many jokes uh, too often in the book. And it just, it's kind of like, okay, you know, you don't need to try to be funny the whole time. Um, and I would say he's a little bit, um, uh, I don't know, his, his, his references to books that he thinks you should read or writers that he points you to are either, in my opinion, not very good or they're just writers I've never heard of. You know, he does have a couple good, uh, you know, sort of uh, references, you know, but he, he, and he has a list of all his favorite books. I haven't heard of hardly any of these people. He does have like War and Peace and maybe some Joseph Conrad and stuff like that in there. But so I don't know, in my opinion, Stephen King, uh, his, you know, maybe these are great authors. I just haven't heard of him, but you would think he would be a little bit more 
uh, familiar with like the classics or maybe some poem poetry. I'm sure he is, but maybe he just wanted to sort of promote some lesser known writers. Uh, so basically the first part of the book basically starts out as a little sort of mini memoir biography about sort of the weird chaotic uh, events of Stephen King's early life. And then it really goes into his writing. Um, and was there anything else about Stephen King that I did want to mention? Um, I forgot what it was. There was something that stuck out to me, uh, but it's escaping me at the moment. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it is a very interesting book. It will motivate you to write. Uh, but like I said, just it's a little bit too preachy and... Um, you know, I don't know, pretentious. Like the, you, you have to read it to understand kind of what I'm saying. But overall, it is a good book. And I am not really a huge Stephen King fan, although I do like to study the way that he writes. I think it's interesting. Um, if you want to be an imaginative writer, I definitely think he's somebody to kind of get under your belt. So let's get into the book haul here. Um, so we did talk about Christopher Marlowe uh, Edward the second so I did find a really cool biography that we're gonna supplement with Edward the second the Christopher Marlowe play maybe in another week or two after we're finished with the play I think this will kind of help me get a little more uh, under my belt about King Edward yeah uh, it's hard to sort of read uh, you know those old Elizabethan poems or plays uh, without a little bit of a with, without a little bit of a sort of a, a, a backbone or a, or a foundation. Uh, this is actually the first biography that's ever been written about Edward II by a man named Harold Hutchinson. So I'm definitely looking forward to this. It's real short, but I think it will definitely put into context uh, the characters in Edward II. We talked about Edward II and his sort of strange relationship with, what is his name? Am I forgetting it? Gaveston. Uh, and I think in my book review, I got... Gaveston mixed up with Mortimer. So uh, there is some rumors that King Edward II had sort of a romantic homosexual relationship with King uh, with uh, um, with uh, Gaveston. So I thought that was interesting. It's definitely an interesting topic for a play. And then, you know, his wife sort of finds out about this affection. And that's sort of what the whole play is about. Edward II by Christopher Marlowe is sort of the unfolding of a kingdom. Uh, due to this strange esoteric relationship that he shares with this other man and also there's a lot of other sort of Machiavellian you know espionage you know stuff where they try to overthrow Edward II and sort of uh, just you know really interesting stuff there from an Elizabethan perspective so we're going to be studying this at some point uh, up next we have this really interesting memoir called My Confederate Kinfolk uh, a 21st century freed woman discovers her roots and basically this uh, let's read the back here uh, starting from a photograph and writings left by her grandmother beloved african-american novelist Thalani Davis goes looking for the white folk in her family a Scottish Irish clan of cotton planters unknown to her and uncovers a history far richer and stranger than she had ever imagined along the way she finds Tartan Plain, unlikely lovers, a lynching close to home, and Confederate soldiers. Her journey challenges us to examine the origins of some of our most deeply ingrained notions about what makes a family black or white and offers an immersive, compelling, intellectually challenging alternative. So this sounds kind of interesting. I think it sort of uh, jumped out at me because it's sort of involving uh, the lineage or the family history of some, you know, african-american slaves or or post slaves uh sort of in a way that gives homage to um the i don't want to say race mixing but the the interracial uh foundations of america or europe even they did mention you know scottish irish stuff so and i think when we're talking about race or racism or or slavery it is important to sort of view it in the context of um a problem or a contribution from the interlocking relationships between blacks and whites that really made America and this doesn't seem to be sort of damning the sort of white population that you would sort of get in a lot of other you know slave narratives or slave memoirs uh, but we'll have to kind of wait and see what she kind of has to tell us it does seem really interesting 
Uh, so we're going to get into that at some point. Uh, up next, we have this beautiful Borders Classics Edition. Do you guys remember Borders books back in the day? Great bookstore. Uh, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky. Beautiful hardcover edition from Borders Classics. Take off the little dust jacket here. Just gorgeous. Uh, Crime and Punishment edition. Really excellent large print. Uh, I haven't read any Dostoevsky yet recently. I was a huge Dostoevsky scholar back in the day, but I just uh, haven't really read him recently. But uh, we do have um, another Dostoevsky over there. What is the title of that? Crime and Punishment. So that's actually the same book. For some reason, I thought that I, I bought another Dostoevsky book. But anyway, now we've got two beautiful copies of Crime and Punishment. Uh, so we'll definitely be getting this under our belt at some point. Go along with the Leo Tolstoy Russian literature. Uh, up next, we have To the Lighthouse, this beautiful hardcover edition of Virginia Woolf. This is supposed to be one of her best novels. Take off the ju dust jacket here so you guys can see it. Uh, beautiful blue coloring there. Just looks really great. So I haven't really had the chance to get some Virginia Woolf under my belt yet, but I think we will maybe start with this. Uh, beautiful large print, gorgeous print brand new book just gorgeous can't go wrong so up next we have this book called the murder of helen jewett uh this is a wonderfully vivid work of detection and history uh it unravels a murder mystery of the same time that it weaves a rich historical tapestry it brings to life new york in the 1830s and yet it bears an eerie similarity to one of the most infamous murder trials of our time this book is a savior. So this seems like a really interesting book. I'm not going to read you the whole thing. Basically a crime story based on a true story. Uh, it's like a, a history books as far as I know. It's not a novel, uh, but it takes place in Manhattan. So it could be sort of in the vein of Jack the Ripper or something. I've sort of reinvigorated my interest um, and morbid curiosity in true crime lately. Uh, so this seems like it'll be kind of right up my alley. And it's kind of vintage. I like those creepy old, you know, Edwardian, not Edwardian, but uh, Victorian sort of crime era stuff. Jack the Ripper, all that good stuff. Seems like it's going to be a super interesting book. Can't wait to get into that. Uh, up next, we have Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux. And I was not aware that uh, Phantom of the Opera was a novel, but I got this beautiful edition here. So we're going to be reading this at some point, maybe over the summer or maybe at some point. I definitely want to read it. It seems really interesting. I didn't know that it was a novel. If, if anybody's read this novel or is familiar with Gaston Leroux, please let me know. Up next, we have this beautiful Penguin uh, little biography uh, about Beethoven. It's called Beethoven, A Life in Nine Pieces. Um, Ludwig von Beethoven, to some, simply the greatest ever composer of Western classical music. Yet his life remains shrouded in myths, and the image persists of him as an eccentric genius shaking his first fist at heaven. Uh, Beethoven by Oxford professor Laura Tunelidge cuts through the noise in a refreshing way. Each chapter focuses on a period of his life, a piece of music, and a revealing theme. From family to friends, from heroism to liberty, it's a winning combination which can transform how you listen to his works. Uh, so this seems really interesting. I'm not sure if it's more like uh, fiction or if it's, I'm assuming it's more like nonfiction. But anyway, beautiful, uh, smells great too, brand new, beautiful pages. I uh, can't wait to get into that. Uh, so up next we have, I just love this cover. This is just a beautiful cover. Beautiful Penguin Classics edition of Madame de Lafayette, the Princess uh, de Cleves. Uh, let's see here. Set towards the end of the reign of Henry II of France, the Princess, the Princess de Cleves, my French is not very good. Uh, tells of the unspoken, unrequited love between the fair noble Madame de Clavis, who was married to a loyal and faithful man, and the Duke de Nemours, a handsome man, most female courtiers find irresistible. Warned by her mother against submitting her passion, Madame de Clavis hides her feelings from her fellow courtiers until she finally confesses to her husband, an act that brings tragic consequences for all. Described as France's first modern novel, The Princess de Cliffs is an exquisite and profound analysis of the human heart and a moving depiction of the inseparability of love and anguish. So this seems really interesting. I can't wait to add this to my uh, 
not only my my reading experience but also my penguin classics edition maybe we'll do like a little penguin collection uh, update for you guys soon looks like somebody left a little annotation in there what does it say interesting uh this is going to be great beautiful new copy it's really short so i'm looking forward to getting into that uh last two ones here we have a beautiful signet classic copy of les miserables by victor hugo this is a great i just love the i love the print uh it's just great i love how concise and how thick it is but how small you could probably fit this you know you can carry this around with you when you go to the doctors when you go to work uh, I guess Victor Hugo, Hugo's Les Miserables is sort of like the French equivalent of uh, War and Peace, perhaps, yeah? So we'll have to check more up on that later. Uh, it's supposed to be a great book. A lot of you guys have probably seen the musical as well. So we're going to be getting into Les Miserables. Uh, I encourage you guys to buy these little small paperbacks. And we do have another small paperback. Uh, it's called All Creatures Great and Small by James Harriet. My dad was actually going to read this, but the print is a little too small for him. It's actually not that small, but he just doesn't like when print is kind of jammed together. So I'll have to get him a large copy, a large print format copy of this. Uh, if you guys are not familiar with All Creatures Great and Small, it was a television show that ran from the late 70s to the late 80s, I believe, or maybe early 80s to late 80s. And now they are revamping it on PBS or, yeah, PBS or something like that. Not PBS. What's that other one? I can't think of the name. Anyway, great show, great topic. It's about veterinarians. So it's really cool. You guys should definitely get, try to get your copy. Uh, you guys should definitely watch the show. The show is absolute gold. And the book, I have not read the book yet, but this is what the show is based on. It's about all the weird characters and all the weird scenarios that James Harriet and Siegfried and uh, all those people uh, get into. Uh, during their careers as veterinarians so thank you so much for watching this video guys please comment down below please share this video follow me on instagram at andrew marlow artist official and i actually have a really cool interesting uh sort of creepy video that we're going to be making for you guys sort of in the realm of uh, true crime and supernatural but related to literature and poetry and i'm super excited to be making that video for you guys so stay tuned for that leave your thoughts in the comment sections on mall flanders by daniel defoe or any of the books we mentioned we will talk to you guys very soon